Is Bitcoin destroying the environment or saving it? It's a question that's been circulating for years in headlines, debates, and documentaries, and it's led a lot of people to wonder, is Bitcoin a waste of energy? So in this video, I wanna break that down by talking about Bitcoin's energy use, how that fits into the bigger picture of global energy use, and then I'm gonna compare that to the financial system that we rely on today. I'll start by asking a question, is energy use in and of itself bad? There's no central authority on this, and we get our opinions from a mix of governments, climate activists, consumers, and market actors like you and me. How we all decide to use energy and what we deem good or bad is subjective, and this comes down to how much you value each energy use. Regardless of what you think about Bitcoin, I think it's undeniable that energy usage has propelled civilization to massive technological changes and quality of life improvements for centuries. Cavemen discovered fire, which gave us warmth and the ability to cook. Electricity in the light bulb let us work around the clock. Railroads cars and planes expanded trade and connected the world. The industrial revolution transformed manufacturing. And now we're in the digital age with the internet and AI boosting productivity and global collaboration like never before. Don't get me wrong, not all energy is created equal. Pollution and destruction of the environment are a serious concern. And I totally understand why so many people want to save it by being careful about how we generate and use energy. Which brings us to Bitcoin, a new technology with some of its loudest critics saying that it is wasteful, dangerous, and unnecessary. So let's start there. What are critics actually saying about Bitcoin? They claim that Bitcoin's energy use rivals countries like Argentina and Ukraine. They claim that Bitcoin miners use fossil fuels that are polluting the air, water, and climate, all for an internet token that is completely made up and imaginary. Organizations like Greenpeace argue that Bitcoin mining threatens national grid stability and diverts electricity away from basic societal needs. It's been blamed for everything from rising emissions to rolling blackouts, and if this is true, it's a serious problem. Right now, Cambridge estimates that the Bitcoin network uses around 195 terawatt hours of energy per year. This sounds big, but global energy use is around 180 thousand terawatts of energy per year, which puts Bitcoin at one tenth of 1% of global energy use. This is a much smaller footprint than many critics suggest. It's just a tiny portion of global energy use. Let's put that into perspective. While yes, Bitcoin does use more energy than some countries, so do companies like YouTube and Netflix coming in around 204 terawatt hours of energy use per year. Other industries also use far more. There's airlines at 246 terawatt hours, data centers at 214, the banking system at 260, and gold mining at 131. Now imagine if the world woke up tomorrow and decided that Netflix and YouTube were a complete waste of time. First off, I wouldn't have a channel anymore. But second off, we would have saved more energy than if Bitcoin disappeared entirely. But that won't happen because people find utility, entertainment, and value in using these platforms, and the value that they get justifies the energy use. Well, I think the outrage over Bitcoin's energy use comes from a good place. I think the deeper question that we need to ask is what makes energy use worth it? And this depends entirely on whether you think Bitcoin is useful or not. So let's talk about usefulness because if you don't think Bitcoin is useful, then there's no amount of energy that will seem justifiable. It's kind of like if you were Scrooge and you hated Christmas, I could show you the electricity bill from all those lights on your neighbor's roof, but it wouldn't matter. You already think the whole thing is pointless. So even if you think Bitcoin is worthless, there's people all over the world that think Bitcoin has value. All right, so what does this actually look like in practice? In developed countries, Bitcoin's usefulness starts with scarcity. It acts as a hedge against inflation, and you can think about it like a long-term savings account on steroids. This allows people to escape inflation and increase their purchasing power over time in an environment where dollars are constantly losing value. In developing countries, the stakes are even higher. Authoritarian governments, currency controls, and hyperinflation are much more common and Bitcoin gives people a lifeline, a way to escape these environments without having to start over from zero. We've seen this in places like Zimbabwe and Argentina and several other countries throughout history where people's savings accounts and bank accounts vanished practically overnight. Bitcoin gives people access to a global financial asset even when their local financial infrastructure has failed them. Bitcoin is useful, but does it really need to use as much energy as an entire country? Bitcoin's energy use comes from a crucial part of how the network operates, something 
called proof of work. This is the process by which miners compete to solve a difficult puzzle. The first one to solve the puzzle gets a reward and transaction fees for that block. The winner of this puzzle gets the privilege of adding that block to the blockchain, which is a public ledger that keeps track of who owns what and the entire history of all of the transactions on the network. This process connects real world energy expenditure to each Bitcoin and it makes stopping transactions or changing the ownership or history of any transactions nearly impossible. The more energy that's expended towards the network, the more secure it is. Proof of work secures Bitcoin because an attacker would have to secure 51% of the network to either sensor or change transactions. As the network grows, the likelihood of something like this happening approaches zero because getting enough mining machines and energy is virtually impossible. All right, so now that you understand why Bitcoin uses energy, the next question to ask is, how does Bitcoin use that energy? And is it wasteful or is it actually productive? Like any big business, Bitcoin miners exist to make money. The reward for these blocks is 3.125 Bitcoin. It comes out to around $370,000 today. And they also get a small portion of the transaction fees that users pay for that block. And in this business, competition is steep. There's millions of miners all over the world competing to solve blocks at any given time. These businesses are very capital intensive because they have to build warehouses by miners mining machines and cooling equipment. And then most importantly, their biggest variable expense is gonna be electricity. The average US household pays 17 and a half cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. And these miners have to find power anywhere from three to five cents per kilowatt hour to remain competitive. The cheaper their power, the more they can profit and reinvest back into the business. If they can't, they mine at a loss and they end up having to shut down. Which brings us to our next question. How are these miners finding power three to five times lower than what you and I pay at home? Bitcoin mining isn't just about energy. It's about finding energy that no one else is using. And the competition among miners has a way of creatively incentivizing businesses to do just that. First up, we have natural gas flaring. When oil companies drill, they often release natural gas as a byproduct. So if there's no pipeline nearby or it's too expensive to capture, they just burn it. This either leaks methane, which is terrible for the atmosphere, Atmosphere, or they flare it into CO2, which is still not great, but slightly better than methane. Flaring wastes about 150 terawatts a year. That's 75% of Bitcoin's entire energy use just going up in smoke. But this is where Bitcoin comes in. Miners can go to the source of where this gas is flared, plug their miners in, and turn what would have been waste into productivity. These miners don't use energy that would have been otherwise used to power homes. They monetize wasted energy that would have been flared up into the sky. Landfills are another big source of methane. Companies like Vespine Energy are now installing Bitcoin miners at landfills, turning that gas into electricity. This reduces emissions and creates low cost power, another win-win scenario. One of the biggest knocks on solar and wind energy is that it's variable. Like the sun isn't always shining and the wind's not always blowing. So in order to account for this, they have to overbuild infrastructure to make sure their grid stays stable. This is very expensive and on top of that, if there is extra power, they have to store it in batteries, which are also very expensive. Bitcoin miners can come in and replace these batteries by acting like a flexible buyer. They can turn on their machines when there's excess power and they can turn them off when the grid needs it. This means that they don't compete with homes for electricity. They're actually coming in to just fill in gaps and this makes renewable energy sources like solar and wind more sustainable and profitable. And this is already happening. As of 2025, it's reported that 50% of the energy used on the network is renewable and just continues to grow. This happens because miners are economically pushed towards finding either renewable or stranded energy to remain profitable and survive. But what about all the places that don't already have energy infrastructure in place? One of my favorite parts about Bitcoin mining, and this is one that you don't hear about very often, is that it's helping power grids grow in places where electricity infrastructure wouldn't normally be built. Let's take Africa, for example. It's too expensive to build infrastructure in remote areas without businesses and people there to pay for it. There's no path to profitability, so investors don't allocate capital there. Bitcoin miners can be instant electricity buyers, even in a local community where that doesn't exist yet. Africa has massive potential for both solar and hydro energy, and Bitcoin gives these communities the opportunity for infrastructure to be built up around them. And as homes, schools, and businesses are built in this community, 
Bitcoin miners can power down, allowing people that need it to access it. In this way, Bitcoin is helping to bootstrap stranded energy and it gives people in these local communities economic opportunity that they wouldn't have otherwise. This isn't just theory, this is actually happening in Africa right now. A company called Gridless has five mining sites across Africa using hydro, geothermal, and biomass energy sources. This is just one example of how Bitcoin isn't taking away from energy infrastructure, it's helping expand it. At this point in the video, if you still think that Bitcoin's energy use is a problem, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. The next question I wanna ask is, what's the alternative? Bitcoin's unique in that the hash rate is public. This means that Bitcoin miners' electricity usage is public for the whole world to see. And I don't think it's fair to talk about Bitcoin's energy use without talking about the system that we're comparing it to. Today's banking system runs on thousands of branches, ATMs, office buildings, and armored trucks, all using massive amounts of energy. Financial centers are concentrated in cities powered mostly by fossil fuels, while Bitcoin can tap into cleaner sources like geothermal, hydro, solar, or even flared gas that would have been wasted. Bitcoin might not replace banks overnight, but it dematerializes them with software, similar to how Kindle reduced the need for libraries, or how Amazon reduced the need for shopping malls. Over time, energy use moves away from carbon-heavy cities and toward distributed, cleaner sources of energy all over the world. But beyond just infrastructure, Bitcoin changes the system itself. It changes how we allocate capital, how we think long term, and how we build an economy. Because when you zoom out, the real issue isn't energy, it's how broken the system has become. Most people don't have the time or energy to attempt to fix some of the major problems that we have in the world today. They're just trying to make enough money so that these problems don't affect them. Inflation, distorted interest rates, and capital markets lead to unnecessary waste and a consumption-based economy desperate to spend dollars before they lose value. This distortion makes smart decision-making for governments, businesses, and people nearly impossible, and it leads to a lot of pollution and unnecessary waste. An example of this happening in recent memory is in 2000, during a low interest rate environment, people were able to build a lot of houses that ended up leading to the collapse in 08 and the great financial crisis. Another example of this is cheap capital and low interest rates in 2020 led companies like Amazon and Shopify to build extra warehouses and hire employees and fleets that they ended up not needing just a couple years later. Bitcoin puts a stop to this by introducing a base level unit that puts a cap on the infinite expansion of the base money and manipulation of interest rates. It brings back a predictable foundation that restores humanity's time so we can start solving real problems again. While Bitcoin does use a lot of energy, it uses it differently. It uses it efficiently. It unlocks stranded power, it supports renewable energy, and it makes the entire grid more sustainable and efficient. Governments and climate initiatives spend billions trying to reduce emissions and improve energy usage, often with little to show for it. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is doing it naturally through open markets, aligned incentives, and a global network of miners, energy producers, and users working toward profitability. In the end, Bitcoin isn't destroying the planet, it's helping to save it from a broken, extractive monetary system and it's doing that one block at a time. My name's Austin, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.